So yeah, I'm gonna start uh, by uh, carrying out a little experiment. So I want you to think uh, of a wild animal, an animal living in the wild. Okay. So first one, one. Right. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's start. So um, in this um, presentation, I'm gonna try to introduce the case of uh, why um, we should uh, intervene in the wild to aid animals. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna get into details or into very technical things. I'm just gonna try to like present the the main the main reasons involved, and I will present first the positive case, and then uh, a couple of objections that can be presented against it, and then I'll try to examine how this may conflict with different environmental issues. So uh, this is the first part: question the little view of nature. So that's the basic case for uh, helping animals in nature. Which is, I think, uh, one that is uh, quite intuitive at first, uh, which is that, uh, well, there is this value in nature, suffering, premature death, and uh, this uh, intuitively seems to be bad. And it seems that we should reduce bad things, uh, at least when doing it doesn't uh, cause worse effect. Now, the problem with this is that many people will say, well, you know, we can accept this, but intervening in nature will always have worse effect, so we shouldn't do it. This is maybe a, a very radical view, but uh, anyway, it's one that we have to examine. Uh, because, um, yeah, sorry, this was the part that I <laughs> missed in the, in the previous uh, argument. So, yeah, this is the, 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 the conclusion that uh, may be challenged <coughs> in this argument. So, uh, the fact is that um, everyone can see that there is lots of uh, suffering in nature uh, due to a number of reasons. Uh, yeah. Uh, Weather condition, uh, lack of food, um, yeah, malnutrition and hunger, um, disease, uh, parasitism and uh, psychological stress, uh, physical injuries. Uh, this, for instance, is the the example. One of the of the examples that uh, drove um, Charles Darwin to, to doubt, you know, this uh, religious faith. This of the human uh, 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 was that you know, they lay their eggs in, into water pillars, caterpillars, and then they eat them from inside and everything, you know. So it seems uncontroversial that uh, there are many animals in nature who are suffering and, and dying when they are very young. Uh, and yeah, well, this is another case. This is um, uh, one case that has been discussed in the literature already by Claire Barber. This is the case of uh, all these wild bees uh, drowned when, uh, during their um, migration. Uh, when they try to cross the Mara River, well, uh, they often can't make it and, and die in great numbers. <coughs> so, uh, it seems we have a stronger case than that initial case, right? Because the initial case wasn't being reliant on whether there was actually uh, a significant amount of suffering and death in nature. We neglect that there is a huge number of animals that have uh, lives that are probably net negative for them. Because, you know, if we think of that caterpillar, or if we think of other animals who may, you know, go through the kind of things we just seen, well, we may claim that this value prevails over value in their lives. There's more suffering than well-being in their lives. So according to a number of normative views, uh, this isn't compensated by other animals, even if they are a majority of animals having good life. Uh, this happens, for instance, in the case of egalitarians, prioritarians, sufficientarians, negative or negative leaning consequentialists, and also uh, in, from a number of uh, deontological views. So according to these views, intervening for the sake of those animals will have priority over uh, promoting all the positive values that there could be in nature, right? And it's a stronger case than the one we, we saw. Today. Now, against this uh, conclusion, we, we, we could defend this idyllic view, which has two versions. So the strong one claims that even if animals have uh, yeah, lives that are that include more suffering than well-being. Still, their lives are good for some reason, whatever, because they are able to live in nature or, or whatever other thing. And the other one that is that on the overall, even if some animals have very bad lives, on the overall, in nature, well-being, positive well-being, always suffer, right? So uh, the strong version is clearly unacceptable if we believe that experiential well-being is valid. Which seems to be a, a, a clearly a, a very intuitive uh, thing. And I'm going to argue that the weak version is wrong. So, um, 
you know, in favor of the weak version, we could uh, think about all the cases we've seen already, of the instances of suffering in nature. But there is another further stronger case, which is this. It's the one that provides us um, population <coughs> dynamics. So this is a, a very basic equation of population dynamics, according to which uh, we can state that um, during a certain period of time, uh, a certain initial population of uh, animals, I mean, it, it, it works for any other organism as well, well, it varies depending on the uh, reproductive rate and of the current capacity of the environment uh, where this population is, right? So, this means that uh, populations will vary uh, depending on two things. Uh, how many offsprings are born and the survival rate of those offspring. I mean, this is very simplistic because, uh, you know, uh, populations are um, fluctuating all the time and, you know, sometimes populations um, are part of meta populations and they migrate to other places, you know, so you should include uh, new individuals and, and you know, and you could also combine this with when you mix uh, the, um, the population dynamics of different species, such as when you consider, for instance, lot couple terra equations and all that, but, you know, for sake of simplicity, we can focus on this. So now, uh, I'm going to make a break here and I'm going to just ask you, um, you know, uh, I told you at the beginning to think of, a, of an animal living in the wild. So, I wonder, could you please raise your hand, those of you who thought of a mammal who's not a rodent or a small mammal, I mean, a relatively big mammal, a cat or... So... Okay, be honest, please. So, how many of you thought of small animals? Small, sorry, small mammals. Rodents, maybe... Uh, Six. Oh, okay, six. How many of you thought of uh, tetrapods such as, um, yeah, um, how many of you thought of uh, birds, uh, um, reptiles, and amphibians? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. How many of you thought of fish, fishes? No one. How many of you thought of invertebrates? Yeah, I mean, this is distorting the thing because I know, I mean, you guys know the, the whole thing, right? So <laughs> this is kind of distorting the thing. How many of you have thought of very young animals or young animals? You know, adult, not adult animals, but young animals. And how many of you, so I, I assume all of you thought of adult animals, right? Okay. Right. I'll come back to this in a so, the thing is that uh, among different life history traits, making it possible for population to grow existence through time, uh, I mean, there are many different uh, strategies, or rather strategies, traits of different strategies that can be combined. I mean, including whether they are semiporous or interoperous, uh, how young they are, whether they reproduce, how long they live. But there is, uh, there are like, Two different strategies that can be uh, taken into account here, which has, you can which are you can maximize R, that is, you can maximize the number of offspring you have, or you can maximize K, that is, you can maximize the survival rate of the offspring. Huh? And what happens is that yes, yeah, some animals uh, uh, do the first thing; they have uh, only one only one child. Huh? But uh, many others don't do this. I mean, there are some who have like mixed. Strategy they may have, I don't know, lay several eggs, four eggs, whatever. But most of them, I mean, the overwhelming majority of animals don't do that. I mean, small rodents may have more than 100 offspring uh, during their life. Uh, yeah, in the case of, of some bears, we have this mixed strategy, but still many offspring too. In the case of other animals, you know, the numbers are even more bigger, bigger as you can see here. Right? So, what happens is that this strategy is, as I said, widely prevalent in nature. So, if we consider what happens in the case of these animals, we can see that, on average, if a population is stable, just one in million per parent will survive. I mean, this never happens. I mean, populations have fluctuating all the time. But if we consider, you know, just for the sake of simplicity, what happens uh, in this case, what we have is that time zero, we have two individuals, at time T1, we may have say, I don't know, 10,000 individuals, 
and at time two, we have two individuals again. So the question is very simple. What happens to the other 9,000? <laughs> you know. So they died. And in many cases, they died shortly after coming into the system. Right? And the fact <coughs> is that, uh, yeah, their lives are very, very short. Uh, so they don't have time enough to contain lots of positive well-being. But still, they often uh, contain the life, the, the experience of gruesome death. They may start to death. Uh, they may die. They may die like this caterpillar we saw the uh, eating alive slowly by other animals and so on, right? So we may say that suffering is maximized for these animals, right? So the problem with this is that life history theory really is uh, supporting the claim that this happens for most. Uh, the species of animals, right? And the problem with this is that we often fail to notice this for a simple reason. We have wholly, widely unrepresentative uh, views of, of, of what animals are living out there. I mean, we saw it here. No fishes, uh, and yeah, two people who know already the arguments uh, to invertebrates. No one said uh, young animals. And you know, this uh, is a very, very qualified audience, right? You are into animal ethics, you are into environmental ethics. You know, I, I've asked this to other, more general audience, and the results are crazy. Like, I don't know, nine out of 10 people say big mammals, you know? And the other two, maybe, or the other ones, maybe say, I don't know, big bird or whatever. Right, so, um, you know, we have certain strong intuitions regarding this, but um, we should be, you know, we shouldn't be confident that they are right. And what happens is that when we consider the actual animals that live out there, we can see that bullfrog may lay up to 20,000 eggs, cost can lay out of 9 million eggs, and some fishes like have to 300 million eggs. You know? So, and this not only happens in the case of the frog, but also of sources dynamic, which many of you are familiar with, this same argument expands to many populations, even in the case of ecological traps. So if any of you are not familiar with this, we can expand later these new questions and everything. So this is the conclusion that uh, the overwhelming majority of animals who come into existence, well, uh, appear to die shortly after. In addition to that, there are several sources of um, yeah, uh, suffering for, for adult animals. So it seems that suffering uh, vastly prevails over, over nature. So I, I'm saying uh, it appears to. You know, I don't want to make the claim. I mean, I, I'm pretty convinced that uh, these arguments are pretty strong. But you know, I may be wrong, but I believe in you know a, a Bayesian approach according to which you have to examine the evidences and, and try to you know put your money where it seems that the case is stronger. Okay. So here we reach the very strong case, right? We saw the basic case, and a stronger case. This is the very strong case, and uh, so. If what we've seen is, is correct, this means that not only egalitarians, prioritarians, negative consequentialists, not only some deontologists, but also others such as utilitarians may have reasons to support intervening uh, significantly in nature. Okay? Uh, and in addition, we have an anti species case for this, because we will certainly intervene if they were humans. So why are we not doing this? Well, simply because they aren't human animals, they aren't humans, right? Uh, not only that, even if we just care a little for these animals, because there are so many, if we aggregate all their interests together, they should come for a lot. So this makes even stronger the case for, for, for helping these animals. And because, yeah, there is so huge this uh, uh, value in nature, it seems that this is a very, very important thing. Okay? So that was the positive case. Let's address now the, the objections. Well, I mean, positive case in the, in the sense that it's defending the case. It's not positive at all. It's quite negative, right? So the first uh, objection that we present against this is that intervention doesn't help. And this is a view that uh, is defended by those who claim that, you know, intervening in nature somehow uh, is thwarting the um, sovereignty, uh, autonomy that these animals, uh, so they should be able to flourish. Uh, the problem is that this view can only be held. I mean, this would be, for instance, the view that uh, I believe that Donaldson and Kimika hold. 
And I think you can only defend this view if you kind of assume the idyllic view of nature. And, you know, uh, when debated with them, uh, they accepted that this would only apply in the case of some animals, but not in the case of those who have huge offspring. So, um, yeah. Mm, it seems that uh, this doesn't apply. And in addition to that, we should also take into account that this argument is somehow assuming this view that animals kind of live in political communities, right? So this is why we should uh, defend their sovereignty. And this is kind of confusing. Uh, these um, two uh, concepts uh, are, are often confused basically because you know, they are using the same term, which is the term community. And a political community is definitely something totally different from a biotic community. A political community somehow entails uh, maybe some kind of collaboration, or if not a collaboration, maybe somehow some kind of shared aims, whatever. And it's true that in nature you will find uh, um, collaboration, you will have uh, symbiosis, uh, commercialism, but then you also have uh, competition, you have antagonism, you even have a mention uh, uh, a mensualism. So yeah, I mean, applying the term of, of political community so vastly as to uh, cover uh, biotic communities, I mean, it, it seems to clearly incur in a, in a fallacy of equivocation. I mean, it's like, like saying that, yeah, we have this political community of, uh, yeah, uh, different uh, parts warring in, in warring in Syria, you know. So you have yeah, in, the interaction uh, of Al Nusra, the Islamic State, uh, Al Assad government, and the Rojava Kurdish, you know, interacting uh, with each other. Well, we wouldn't say that. And and yet that is more similar to what happens in the case of nature, because if the parallelism with human political communities were to stand, we would kind of say that. Uh, Animal communities, so to speak, if we are to use that term, would be in a permanent state of humanitarian catastrophe. So their situation would be like that of uh, failed states. So yeah, it seems that uh, this argument, uh, I think it, it fails with this reason. Then there are other objections that are pessimistic that claim that intervention can't succeed. And they can be presented in two ways, right? There is a strong version which claims that it is impossible to reduce uh, suffering and death in nature. And then there is um, the weaker version of the that is impossible to end it. And the strong version appears to be uh, wrong. I mean, it's, it's just too strong. I mean, there are many cases in which we consider, we can consider that we are helping animals. And of course, we can say, well, but you know, this may have other negative effects on other animals. But in many cases, this isn't clear, right? Uh, so it seems that, yeah, they are resting. This, this is a very recent. Uh, picture just the other day we were rescuing some elephants in Cambodia. Yeah, and we are all familiar with all these kind of initiatives. And it says that, uh, you know, all things considered, it might well be that by doing this, we are actually reducing uh, suffering in nature. I love this picture. This is a, you know, a, a, a northern bird sanctuary picture. Uh, yeah, this is a, a baby reno in, in Nepal. And yeah, I mean, there are many reasons of this. Uh, not only when you consider the case of any individual animals, there are other cases in which, uh, you know, more animals uh, are helped. We can consider um, what happens when, you know, due to um, yeah, climatic conditions, uh, maybe there is enough food, the summer has been too hard, or winter, and there are these initiatives to uh, prevent these animals from starving. Uh, this is in, in Turkey uh, during some particularly hard weather. This is uh, not far from where I live, actually. This is northern Spain, and this uh, just a few years ago, some activists uh, were there to carry some food to animals who were starving. Deer corpses were appearing, and these uh, animals and these uh, activists were were there to distribute food. These are other examples. You can see this nice picture of this animal thing here. Also, another clear example is that of vaccination. So, um, you know, it's been some decades already. If you consider, for instance, this paper, you can see the date, 1988. So, animals have been, wild animals have been vaccinating against um, uh, several different diseases, including different kinds of flu, uh, tuberculosis, and Maybe the most spectacular case is that of rabies. I mean, rabies has been eradicated for uh, large areas of North America and Northern Europe. Um, 
And well, the way they do it is, you know, they, they use these baits, which, has the, which have the, the vaccine, and they, they distribute it in nature, and they, have, they are tasty for these animals, the smell is nice for them, so they either use these uh, distribution devices, or often, you know, with helicopters, they just uh, throw them. And it works. Of course, we are doing this for our own sake. We don't want those animals to pass those diseases for us or, or to be animals to live with. But this clearly shows that it would be perfectly feasible to intervene in massive ways that uh, would uh, clearly um, help uh, a lot of animals and reduce lots of suffering. So it seems that, yeah, the strong version um, doesn't work. And as for the weak version, well, the weak version doesn't entail that it would be uh, uh, that would be good to reduce uh, uh, all this stuff. So maybe we can eradicate it, but so what? I mean, if we can reduce it as much as possible, if we can eliminate as much of this value in nature as possible, then it seems that that would be good. Then, however, there are um, other pessimistic views that use a different argument, which is the argument from unexpected consequences, right? So in this strong version, it says that intervention will for sure have uh, unforeseen consequences that may be catastrophic. And on the weak version, uh, the argument is that intervention may have these unforeseen uh, uh, effects. So, is it that the strong version appears to be self-defeating? Because how can you be sure? How can you foresee things in order to claim that uh, we can't foresee things? And the weak version claim uh, it seems to contradict the, the strong one. So, I think that weak version definitely is correct, right? So we should definitely accept this. It is certainly true that uh, intervention may have unexpected consequences. So we should be definitely aware of that, and uh, we should try to do our best in order to understand uh, things better. But it's also useful to consider one thing, which is that the pessimistic view, although very pessimistic concerning how things could be, is in turn quite optimistic regarding how things actually are in nature. And to say this, just consider, uh, just compare these two scenarios. Consider first real world. In real world, as we saw, on average for each animal of the reproduces, only one of her or his uh, offering survives. So given, yes, an offering of 10,000, as we saw before, 9,998 of them die, only two of them survive. Fair enough. So now let's consider what happens in a catastrophic event. Suppose that this catastrophic event results of half of the population of animals being wiped out. This is like something quite catastrophic. Many people will say so. So what happens then? Massive death. Hmm? Well, what happens is that massive death is exactly, from the point of view of individual animals, it's just like real world. Except, well, you know, it's not 9,998, it's 9,999, right? So, from the point of view of, of the animals involved, really, <coughs> if massive death is catastrophic, which I don't, I don't want to deny it is, you know, we have to look at real war, it's already catastrophic as well, you know? And, I know, this is terribly hard to show up, to show up. I understand that, and, and I mean, let me tell you one thing, because I know that many, many of you who may have strong environmentalist views uh, are hating me right now. But uh, <laughs> let me just, uh, I mean, uh, just a biographical thing. When I was uh, like completing my, my, my PhD dissertation uh, 10 years ago, uh, the first final version of it was claiming that, you know, even though we have this difference between animal ethics and environmental ethics, or rather between, to be more accurate, between, you know, the consideration of sentience and the consideration of other criteria, in practice, you know, they, they all converged when it came to, you know, uh, preserving the environment or conserving the environment because that was good for, for animals. I mean, I was always in for the arguments to help uh, animals in nature. I mean, <coughs> you know, is, is a, uh, our nothing forgotten uh, great animal ethicist, one of the best ones uh, in the 80s, I mean, amazing guy in my view, uh, has convinced me of that. But still I thought that, you know, that nature was on the overall pretty good. But then, you know, as I was writing, I was thinking, okay, I have to back this claim with some empirical, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, 
background. And as I was doing research, all the research I was doing was actually, you know, rebutting my intuition. Well, no, this is wrong. No, this is wrong. This is wrong. And at some point, I, I had to accept, no, this can't be wrong. I mean, there's something. No! I think it was like, you can imagine, I mean, I struggled against it really, and eventually I had to accept it. So, and other people I've, I've, I've talked about, I mean, Brian Tomasic, you may also have uh, read some of his excellent stuff on this topic. I mean, he reports the same, the same experience. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I can kind of sympathize with your aversion towards this conclusion, but I'm sorry, I, mean, I think it, it and I hope I'm wrong, I deeply hope I'm wrong, but I, I think I'm not. Whatever. So, um, yeah, um, in addition to that uh, pessimistic argument, somehow assume that uh, we will never be able to transform nature or that if we do something horrible will occur. But the fact is that we are already intervening in nature all the time. And here are some examples of this uh, that contradict uh, this claim. For instance, here we have Venus. Clear contradiction, a clear case of intervention in nature. We have created a, 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 a town, I mean, well, some people have created a town, or else. In the middle of some swamps with some really cool ecosystem, I think. Well, cool from the environmental viewpoint, of course. We build hospitals, uh, libraries, we, you know, uh, grow uh, food. This is radical intervention in nature. And we are carrying it all the time. So what happens is that humans are intervening all the time in nature, but the thing is that environmental management uh, policies uh, are just informed by uh, anthropocentric uh, viewpoints, and in some cases, by environmentalism. <coughs> you know, um, environmental, environmental management policies, I, I think we could include those who are you know, carried out under that label, and any other way of intervening in nature. You know, it's a policy that entails somehow uh, affecting uh, the environment. So, why isn't it possible to make a shift in the end of these uh, ways of acting so not only those ends are further, but, but also those uh, that uh, consider um, the interests of uh, non-human beings? Right, so um, to conclude with this part, I would say that um, if we take into account uh, the objections uh, regarding the unforeseen uh, possible consequences of this, but also the responses we can give to this, I would say that the most cost-efficient courses of action today don't include trying to radically intervene right now, but rather to question speciesism, which is a major reason why this uh, 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 view isn't accepted. Also to spread the view that we should intervene in nature, right? Because it may, we may reach a point at which we have the knowledge needed to this, but we may just lack the will to do it. And then to support those interventions that are currently feasible for two reasons. First, because they could uh, uh, result in many animals being healthy. And second, because they will help to you know, make this idea um, better known to the, to, to the people and also especially to those influential people, those who are researchers, and those who may you know, influence the policies that may be carried out. And then, of course, uh, we need to do research on the ways to help wild animals. And regarding this, I want to say something, uh, which is um, this may seem like a completely new field of research, but in fact it's not. Much of the evidence is already there. The problem is that um, there is no such thing as the discipline, the subject in biology of what we could uh, name uh, welfare biology or welfare ecology. This uh, name of welfare biology was um, proposed uh, 20 years ago by Yu Kuan Kun, uh, the Singaporean uh, uh, economist, who, um, who claimed that uh, yeah, uh, if we just uh, you know, assume and the values that we all appear to have when it comes to, you know, what matters. And we are not speciesists, then it seems that this discipline should exist. But the thing is that even if this discipline doesn't exist so far, a large part of the research that that discipline should carry out has been already carried out. Uh, by life history uh, theorists, by population ecologists, uh, by ecosystems ecologists, 
So, so yeah, I mean, uh, we're not that far, really. We just need people to take these issues seriously. And then uh, the last point I want to uh, tackle is uh, to what extent this uh, means uh, yeah, some kind of convergence or divergence with uh, environmentalist view. And uh, yeah, well, it's clear to see that divergence would be more significant than convergence. Uh, but there are some points of convergence, right? So yeah, we have this uh, conflict there. And the problem with this conflict is that when it comes to this, and when we see uh, that all we have seen is uh, entailed by this view, by the sentience view, and when we clearly uh, realize that uh, views, um, holistic views, or views focused on the conservation of, of wilderness will clearly oppose this, it seems that uh, it's kind of difficult to see how we can move forward with the discussion, because we are appealing to you know, certain core values, certain core beliefs that are hard to shatter. I mean, uh, it's hard for me to imagine how uh, someone could uh, convince me that uh, I should reject the sentient view because you know, I, I hold it because I, I have this deep understanding that what is valuable for someone needs to involve somehow uh, some affection of, of her or his positive or negative well-being. I mean, in defending this view against uh, these positions, I could present some arguments. So, for instance, <coughs> uh, the views, I could claim that maybe they have a, a bias towards the present because, you know, if we intervene, wholly new uh, uh, ecosystems could uh, be created. So, you know, if we value the existence of ecosystems, why are some ecosystems more valuable than others? Why aren't holistic and, um, you know, ecocentrists uh, regretting that uh, due to, you know, the course of natural history, so many ecosystems no, no longer exist, right? And again, I know that this may not be convincing to them. Uh, on the other hand, I may claim that their view may be a species as one. Because, for instance, suppose that um, we defend this view, uh, in this case, how and the homeless? So, suppose that there are homeless uh, human beings uh, having a really hard time, suffering a lot and dying. So we build new homes for them. And we don't build them, you know, we don't build them in the, in the middle of the Amazonia or, you know, in the middle of, the, I don't know, the Grand Canyon. No, not there. But they're in the outskirts of, of Montreal. But you know, in a place where there was maybe some yeah. grass or trees, whatever. I mean, most people accept this. I mean, there will be some people who would reject this. I mean, Tante Lincoln may reject this and other people. But most people who hold the environmentalist view clearly would accept this. And then if opposing housing the homeless is wrong, then it seems that from an anti-species viewpoint, opposing intervention to help one animal should be wrong too, right? So I think this is from it, uh, from it. And then we are left with another view, which is uh, biocentrism. So we could hold what I think is a wrong interpretation of biocentrism, claiming that we shouldn't intervene in nature, because in that way we can let all living entities uh, live. But I don't think this, is, this can be correct. Because I think that the rejection of the idyllic view would apply not only for sentient beings, but also for uh, any other living entities. Right? The same thing we've seen in the case of uh, beings who can suffer and uh, who can uh, uh, experience uh, whatever, happens also in the case of other living entities. So I think that biocentrism really, if consistent, should support the case of intervention too. Of course, someone would, would say, well, you know, but what I value of the existence of life is not, uh, you know, what goes in the interest of this living entity, this living entity, but the fact that there exists life. But that would be a totally different view from individualistic uh, uh, biocentrism. And this, you know, this may kind of support this view which I guess that many of you have thought about this already, which is that maybe biocentrism is not really an environmentalist view after all. Uh, haven't you ever thought about this? I mean, I, I've been thinking about this for, for, for a long time because, you know, there is this idea. I mean, the term environment some, somehow refers to what's surrounding us, you know? So this conflict between animal ethicists and environmental ethicists can often be presented as uh, in this, that somehow environmentalists tend to claim, okay, we should uh, care for what surrounds us, and animals are part of what surrounds us, so we should care for them. 
Whereas, um, you know, those who defend the, the moral consideration of non-human animals would say, no, 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 this is not so. Maybe we should care uh, for what, maybe we should care of, of what surrounds us, but uh, animals are not part of what surrounds us. Animals are within our own group. Animals are us. Because we are uh, equal in the relevant sense, which is we are sentient. So maybe I as a tourist could claim kind of something similar to this, right? Anyhow, uh, <coughs> I just pointed at this, you know, for the sake of trying to find convergences. So I'll finally point some um, yeah, specific uh, cases in which there might be some convergence, but surely for wildly uh, different reasons. So maybe the protection of certain species, certain flat species, maybe, I don't know, elephants, uh, for instance, and maybe supported by those who accept what uh, the arguments we've seen before, because these uh, large animals, uh, they eat lots of biomass, so they prevent uh, that a uh, smaller animal exists, so in this way, uh, trophic change in the uh, ecosystems in which they are are smaller, are shorter. Uh, in the case of whales, it's not clear, because, it's not clear, you know, because the fish is the, the shit of the, of the web, it's probably uh, enriching uh, all the places, but well, you know, maybe we have a convergence here. Maybe in the case of desert areas, you know. Uh, if you are a, a, an ecocentrist, you may claim that uh, greening certain uh, desert areas would be wrong because we would lose that environment. And you know, uh, if we accept what we've seen before, we claim, well, less biomass is great, so yeah, we should go for protecting the surface. But you know that the reasons are actually different. And also the case of fighting climate change. And um, here's where we can maybe reach a similar conclusion for wildly uh, uh, different reasons, which is that, you know, due to the way uh, land masses are distributed on the planet, it seems that uh, if climate, climate change leads to uh, um, a significant global warming, that will mean that the total biomass on Earth will increase very, very significantly. You know, uh, Canada and Russia will uh, be full of, of uh, forests and all that. So there will be many, many more living animals in nature. So uh, yeah, as there will be more life, uh, there will be more, much more suffering. So yeah, we don't want that. Though this is unclear because on the other hand, as you know, um, a warmer climate means also uh, less biomass in the oceans, especially, you know, in the Arctic and Antarctic Sea. Uh, this isn't clear whether it affects the environment because it depends on whether very small animals, copepods and three yeah, of these animals, uh, are sentient. If they are not, then we should go for this. If they are, the case would be unclear. So, yeah, I think... Uh, I think that's basically it. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, sorry if I have said nasty things. I mean, I can hear you, but uh, whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. So with apologies to those people's names, I don't know questions. So, yeah, back to you. Uh, keep your hands up. You can go ahead, though. Okay. Uh, Referring back to your first experiment where we all raised our hands and what we were thinking of and so on, have you counted the slides that you showed of large mammals being rescued yeah. and so on? And the follow-up question is, suppose that we do say 99.99% of severely R-related species, uh, wouldn't the planet be soon over, you know, sort of overrun with fishes or whatever due to these uh, interventions that we uh, might make? So, uh, yeah. <coughs> how can you defend uh, criticizing uh, our concern about <coughs> large mammals and then, uh, you know, yeah. show us examples of those that are in fact intervened on their behalf. Great. I've been asked this before. I mean, excellent two questions. I think they're, they're great questions. So, uh, yes, I'm totally guilty of, of that, of, of showing these uh, uh, pictures of mainly mammals being held. So, um, but then, I mean, uh, where's my excuse? So, when I presented these, these uh, slides, 
showing how I think we should uh, uh, act now. I didn't say we should intervene right now to reduce uh, animal suffering and death significantly. We should do other things. We should do research. And one thing we should do is promote undergoing the interventions that are being carried out now in order to make more acceptable the view that intervening for the sake of animals is good. So this is just what I did, you know. It was uh, kind of showing that uh, we can do it. But this is definitely not what we should aim at. We should uh, eventually aim at uh, intervening to aid other animals. And this drives me to the other question, which was, you know, the, the very deep question. So how really to intervene in that case? Okay. So, um, well, tomorrow we're going to have a presentation by uh, Duncan, who is around, yeah, and uh, I don't know what he is going to say about that, but uh, I think that um, it's only at the level of, uh, you know, environmental management as such that we can make a whole difference. I mean, of course, we could support uh, building parking lots and, and, and the like, uh, but uh, in addition to that, um, it seems that we can um, reach a point at which we see how uh, different ecosystems uh, vary with regards of how many suffering and death are in them. So you can have an ecosystem with more biomass, with more bio primary production, you can have ecosystems with longer trophic chains. Um, then the limiting factors affecting those populations can vary. So for instance, if the limiting factor of a certain population is, uh, say, disease that's uh, far worse than, it's, uh, than if it is predators, then we have certain predators that can <coughs> way more harm than other predators, even if they kill the same uh, number of animals because of the way they, they kill them. So this is where we should end. Uh, just one follow-up. Um, am my understanding you to say that it's really better to have fewer animals and therefore fewer, uh, less suffering. Um, is, I mean, th this was the, so That's I just correct. wanted that statement to be clear. That is correct. Yeah. So we, in order to save the animals, we, we just, we eliminate their existence uh, in, in order to prevent their suffering. Right. That is correct, yeah. Uh, though, uh, for instance, I think that the, that the life of many animals is not positive. When it, I mean, the life of, of gorillas, the life of, I don't know, um, uh, yeah, wildebeest, for instance, uh, maybe the life of birds, you know, the life of birds, birds are kind of in between, at least some birds, not all of them, but some birds. Uh, I think that if I can have a world with, those, if, I, if it were possible to have a world with those animals, only them, which is it's obviously not. I mean, that would, would, would be fine. The problem comes when it comes to other animals. And you may say, well, but all small animals reproduce in, in, in these other ways. Well, most of them, uh, for instance, uh, ants, I think that the existence of ants may be net positive, but the existence of many beetles, for instance, is, is not. But well, you know, this would, yeah, would entail going through much more detail in particular cases, yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, I guess in my talk this morning, I defended what you call the weak idyllic view, so I won't. I, I could offer some other uh, arguments uh, of that type, but I, um, I think in, instead, uh, I appreciate uh, Baird's clarification that what you're talking about is mostly preventing most sentient animals from coming into existence, which to me maybe uh, warrants the label of, of anti sentientism, because sentience bring suffering, we should reduce sentience to the point where, I mean, that, that may or may not be, uh, be fair, but, but I guess another um, worrisome aspect of what you're talking about is that it's not actually a shift from intervening for the sake of humans to intervening for the sake of animals, it's actually an expansion of human domination. So we're not going to replace Venice with the wildlife hospital, instead we're probably going to grow Venice and then go out into the wild and start, you know, heavily manipulating the ecosystem, etc. So, um, did, did, yeah, I mean, would, would you agree that, that it's not really a shift, it's more of an expansion of, of the sphere of, of human domination that you're talking about? I mean, well, uh, to start with, with regards to that, uh, to, 
regarding the label anti-sentientism or sentientism, I don't know, depending on what you're meaning by that. Uh, I think that uh, what is uh, valuable is just positive experiences and, that, and what is negative is only negative experiences and I think it's better if uh, there are less uh, uh, negative experiences. And I, I happen to be also an egalitarian, uh, as many people are in human society, you know. They think that, you know, uh, inflicting terrible suffering or allowing the terrible suffering of certain human beings for the sake of the flourishing of others is impermissible, right? So if you accept this, and if you are against speciesism, and the case against speciesism is really strong, uh, then uh, I think that uh, if this evidence <coughs> really entail what I think they may entail, then the conclusion is unavoidable. So, um, so yeah, I mean, regardless of how you want to, you know, uh, name that that conclusion. And as regard the shift of this band, uh, well, uh, I don't know. I mean, I I think it's just a matter of, of a term, really. I mean, the. the I don't like the term human domination because domination somehow entails that you have some individuals who are benefiting from harming other individuals, right? So that's what the term, term domination uh, 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 brings to mind, right? And uh, in this case, it will be the other way around. It's not about benefiting by harming the animals. It's about benefiting the animals. I mean, even if that's not the most convenient uh, thing uh, uh, for us, I mean, it's not convenient for me, certainly. I, I, I rather enjoy uh, uh, going in the wild, but, uh, yeah. No. Yeah, I think you it would be helpful if you distinguish two claims. One claim is, like, um, if we can uh, reduce suffering of free living animals, we have a primal case duty to do so. I think many of us would be on board with that. And that was for all your examples of actually helping animals were about that, where people try to reduce the suffering of animals, fine, you know, and doing research into how to do that more often. Yeah. But your other claim is, I think, more problematic, and that's your claim that uh, overall in nature suffering outweighs well-being. I'm not convinced by that. Um, you said like most animals have lives that are net negative. Most animals are insects, and they are non-sentient as far as I know. I, I would need to see the empirical data, because I mean that's an empirical claim. And you mentioned um, frogs, cods, I don't even know what cods are, sunfishes, I, I don't know how sunfishes look, but are they sentient? How long and how intensely do they suffer? Uh, how much pleasure do they experience? These are crucial elements of your argument. And I really don't know, I don't, I don't have the facts here. And um, if we move, I mean, frogs, you, you mentioned the number of 10,000 that applies to frogs. Are frogs sentient? Do these tiny things <laughs> suffer when they die? I don't know, you know. As soon as we move to rodents, mice, I mean, like if a, if a pair, a couple of ma mice has like 10 offspring, eight die, I can imagine that they have uh, pleasant experiences before they die. I mean, they might enjoy, enjoy the warmth, the sun, whatever, uh, company, smell. So I'm just not sure about the empirical data. And that's, that's your second claim, and that's a more problematic claim. And that's a claim that involves like reducing the number of animals. And that's uh, needs more support. Okay, thank you for this opportunity to clarify the argument. So, um, actually, I made three distinctions. So, I think there are three cases here. So, we have the, bi the basic case, uh, which was uh, uh, presented at the, at the beginning. And this is the one that I think uh, is um, yeah, relatively controversial to many people, right? And, and you actually said that you agree with that. Then there is the second, the stronger case, which is many animals in nature uh, uh, have very bad lives. I think this is uncontroversial, uh, really. And, and, and really, honestly, I, 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 I don't think that, I mean, although I think... Uh, it's not uncontroversial, because the, the species that you mentioned, I don't even know whether they are sentient. But, no, but that, that would be the other, sorry, that would be the other, the other uh, uh, claim. I, I, very bad lives, I don't know. Wait, but... Um, <laughs> sorry, I thought it's not obvious to me at all. Okay. Uh, Right, so I thought you were 
referring before in your, in your objection to um, the argument I presented for the very strong view. So there is the basic view, the stronger view, and the very strong view. The very strong view is the one that is based on the idea that suffering prevails over positive happiness, right? We have a case in between, which is, it might be that happiness, that happiness uh, prevails over suffering in nature. Why do it prevail over, over happiness in nature? But still, there are some animals that have very bad lives in nature, right? I think it's implausible to claim that no animal in nature has a very bad life. This seems to me really implausible. Uh, um, I mean, like for instance, this. Uh, uh, I mean, you can see like um, videos on YouTube if you want of uh, you know uh, lions uh, and another predators attacking a, a pregnant uh, a calf, uh, a pregnant uh, uh, ungulate. Cow had some enjoyment before it suffered this one hour or however long. Of Please time. let them. <laughs> Let me go on with the argument. So, okay, go with the objection. Uh, I mean, I'm going to move it on to the uh, Okay, right. So, so the thing is, um, just just an example. I mean, this is something that you can see on YouTube. You can see on YouTube videos of predators attacking pregnant animals. The pregnant animals give birth, okay. and the newborn animals are starting to be eaten by the predators. Sure, that's through. Fine. Through, uh, through some time, I mean, they, don't, they aren't killed immediately, so they, they suffer for, for hours, maybe. So, I've seen it on YouTube, so I can claim that there are some animals whose lives are... I, I think, right, okay, and I think, I, 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 I think it's reasonable to assume that many other animals are in this situation. So, if we accept this, and we are egalitarians, prioritarians, or if we are negative consequentialists, uh, we want, uh, uh, um, I mean, we will accept the view that intervening to transform this is uh, uh, what we should do. Then, the stronger case, case is necessary only if you are a utilitarian uh, and you, uh, in order for you to intervene, you have to accept that total uh, well-being is less than total suffering. And so your argument against this uh, is based on the idea that uh, all those animals are exempt. <coughs> Uh, well, as uh, in a previous discussion uh, um, I mentioned already, I think that we don't know which animals are sentient, but I think the case is very, very strong to claim that uh, a significant number of invertebrates are sentient, including uh, um, insects who have a, a nervous system with small brains, and I think that it doesn't stop there in, in the case of arthropods, such as uh, insects that may be crustaceans. Also, in the case of other animals, I, I, I mentioned before gastropods and, and yeah, uh, bivalves, uh, they don't have brains, but they have these uh, pairs of, of ganglia, and the, um, you know, the behavioral evidence uh, supports this view. They are aversive to uh, negative uh, uh, stimulus. So I think the case is strong to claim that they are sentient. Even if they weren't, I find it very implausible that fishes aren't sentient, so the case would still apply. Anyway, so, Sophia, you have a short follow up on this or do you want to? Sorry. On the, on the end? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, next is Angela. Thanks. Um, yeah, but well, when you think, when you think about, about other cases, and I, ho I hope you can clarify your point of view of this. So, I mean, there are some kind of, I mean, we are constantly to be in nature, I agree. We are building streets, uh, new buildings. And I wonder, I mean, we can also intervene positively for the sake of animals in nature by adapting our environment to the needs of animals. For example, if you build a new street, we can build bridges mm -hmm. over the streets, and um, we can um, build buildings so that animals still can move in between, and we don't put it in the root of wildlife. And I was wondering, just, just to clarify your point of view, I mean, all these aids also extend the lifespan and, and just maybe the suffering of the animals. So, would you be in favor of this? Although it has for the consequence that, for example, the deer does not get run over by a car, but then it lives in constant fear for four more years by wolves. So I have the strong uh, view that, uh, or I, I seem to think that you, you, you really claim that we should maybe go for some extinctionist view, but I don't think you really want to defend that. So what do you think about this intermediate intervention, which then have as a consequence that animals might live longer time and stress and fear? 
I think that saving animals' lives in nature is, is good, and it and it um, it leads to them having better life. It leads them to, the, to them having a life which contain more positive value. Uh, I also think that in addition to suffering, death is a disvalue. Uh, um, and actually, the reason why I would claim this is that, um, uh, well, this is something that we've been discussing uh, in between talks uh, before this. So when it comes to having a kind of a way to measure uh, how much suffering there is in nature, I think that uh, the best tool we have in, perf in perfect activities is life history tables, mortality tables. Mm -hmm. So when you have like a table uh, which, uh, which uh, um, shows that most animals die at the beginning of, of their existence, so this is time, this is the number of individuals, but you have a life table um, such as this one, then it's very likely that the lives of these animals are net negative. When you have a human-like one, then our lives uh, uh, are almost surely net positive, uh, uh, you know, as a whole. So anything that somehow pushes this and makes this go uh, just like this is helping us. Valerie, quick Just a clarification on this: it, it, it only applies to herbivore, right? So you can want to save a predator. How about the predator? Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it depends on, yeah, things, things become trickier, trickier when it comes to predators. That's right, yeah. So, it's complex. We have to look at the at what the, the ecology tells us. Uh, you know, as, as we were saying before, in, there is um, this argument regarding the reintroduction of wolves. And, uh, you know, once I wrote a paper and I said, that, you know, maybe this means that there is more suffering, if we were to do spreads of that, they were all over there. But um, in discussion, I, uh, you know, I can see that if this prevents more mesopredators, smaller predators from being around, the ecology is needed. But I agree that there is, there is certainly a point there, yeah. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes and six questions, so I reckon we can do it, but I'm just going to ask people to be... Uh, succinct. So I should also know your name, but yellow t shirt. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> yes. Cool. Uh, so, following on this idea that there's sort of a background mass catastrophe that changes the calculus of what the risks and benefits are. Uh, so, following that, or parallel to that, is, is it also significant that like all life on Earth is doomed? Like, unless we find a replacement for our sun, eventually, Earth will stop supporting life. Does having that sort of secular horizon on the rest of your life change the calculus at all about sort of what our risk horizon is? Yeah. Should everyone fill and then I will read? Um, let's take, no, yeah, just respond now. And then we'll see okay, that makes it even more scary because, uh, I mean, that uh, drives us to consider what happens if humans spread nature to other places. I mean, this is being discussed now with regard to Mars. So if you defend the wilderness, maybe you would claim, you would be an environmentalist, would claim we shouldn't bring life to, to Mars, we should leave it untouched. And we will agree totally, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a kind of a scary problem, because of that, the possibility of, you know, spread this. Over here in the back? Yeah. Um, I, my yes. question's already been answered. Okay. So, Ned. Um, I can do this quickly, but uh, I'm trying to figure out what you think is positive and what you think is negative. So, so the death is negative, um, suffering is negative, um, it, the life is positive. Right? So, so the, the, the ten-second life of the fish that suffers pain, but the fact that it's alive that that's positive. Or in addition, separate from the suffering. No, no. I would say so, that only. That which you experience as positive, like positive experiences, enjoying them. But like, you, sorry, but you said death is negative. Yeah. But life is not positive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is but this is a tricky issue. I mean, all of you who are into the philosophy of death know how hard it is this thing that death is an extrinsic disvalue because it deprives you of positive uh, value. So yeah, it's tricky, but uh, it's not it's not just difficult in this case. It's difficult in the case of human beings as well. So, just are there other positive things in nature besides the pleasure? I mean, it, so the aesthetic value or the, the, the complexity of ecosystems. Does any of that sort of out not outweigh? Does it count against the suffering? Or 
Or is it just, are you just kind of a sentientist and all, the only value is pleasure and pain, except for death, that's a disvalue. So. Um, no, suffering is, is, is a disvalue, right. Yeah, right. that's my view. But, um, you know, uh, it may well be that other people value other things. Even if they value those other things, they should consider this huge amount of this value. And it may be that this huge amount of this value always is possible values, which I don't think there are, but other people may. Josh? Thanks. Um, I am prepared to concede that it is sometimes morally acceptable to intervene in nature, so I'm not that view. I'm even willing to concede begrudgingly that there are sometimes very good moral reasons to intervene in nature, very begrudgingly. But I wonder how you understand your claim uh, as related to justice. Do you think that animals suffering in nature have a claim of justice on us uh, to intervene on their behalf? Right, so it depends on, on, on what you uh, understand as justice, right? Because for instance, suppose you uh, accept um, an egalitarian conception of justice according to which, you know, uh, the fact, the simple fact that you are, are an individual uh, whose life can, be, uh, can go better or, or worse make you have a claim uh, and make you, uh, puts you in a situation to complain that a situation in which uh, the distribution of value that there is is wildly, unvalued, wildly unfavorable to you and favorable to others is unjust. If you accept this, then the answer will be yes. So I'm asking what you believe. I, can I cite you? Uh, yeah, can I'm, I say Walter believes yeah. that we have a duty of justice? Yeah. To yeah, you know, uh, I, I don't think you need, I mean, but you are then asking me something totally different from what I've uh, 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 talked about now. Where you are asking me about what my normative views are. And I think you don't need to appeal to justice uh, to defend a normative view. You can defend an, an egalitarian view, and even at a certain sensible, sensitive view, um, without appealing to justice, just in, in terms of, you know, what is better for what sort of reason. But, you know, Maybe, yeah, justice, uh, the, maybe the speech of, of justice, the language of justice is good. So, yeah, uh, no problem with that. Thanks. So, this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe you already replied to that, but I was wondering uh, if you think that's a great comment. Uh, what do you think about Paris, parasitism? Yeah. And uh, what do you think also about competition? Because you're focusing on predation and uh, Sufferings that can uh, be brought by explanation, but uh, I think that competition and uh, parasitism can also bring some suffering. And, uh, yeah. and, and so, because you're like, trying, I, mean, I don't know, but like, you, yeah, because you're focusing on predation and like not to kill all predators, but kind of, uh, like, I'm, I'm just wondering. Right. Well, first of all, I, I, I'm, re I'm really not focusing on, pre on, on predation. I mean, it was just a, a, a reply to, to your question. Um, and I actually think that other limiting factors, that is, other main uh, causes of death for certain populations, cause much more suffering than, uh, than predation. So, for instance, and uh, well, I mean, it varies. But it depends on because it's much worse to be it's much worse to be killed by a hyena than by, uh, say, uh, a lion, so, or by a Komodo dragon, you know, they eat you alive, uh, so, yeah, or these poisonous beetles that, you know, paralyze their, their victim and they eat them for days, you know, some forms of predation are really horrible, but on the overall, um, it's probably a, a, a not as bad way to die, such as, for instance, starving or parasitism or maybe a, a disease as well, right? So, so yeah, I mean, parasitism would be an issue here, uh, similar to predation, because you know it involves uh, conflicting interests. So, as in the case of other uh, problems concerning conflicting interests, we just have to you know, somehow consider the, all the interests involved of the involved parties and of others who may be recipients of uh, you know cascade efforts, and, and we would see. But yeah, it, it, it is certainly an issue because. Um, yeah, most animals uh, who exist are, are invertebrates. If nematodes are sentient, which I don't know, really, uh, that would mean that, uh, you know, uh, maybe the proportion of animals that are parasites may be a significant large one. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly an issue uh, to take into account, but 
I don't think it makes really a difference with respect to the to the main uh, yeah arguments involved here. Okay, so we're going to take two final questions together. First from Duncan and then from Jeff. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, I was wondering how I guess this is a this question about how bad things really are in nature, mm -hmm. and I couldn't. It, it didn't seem to me. It wasn't clear to me how bad you needed things to be in nature in order to make your case. Uh -huh. Because it doesn't seem like you need any animals to have, on balance, bad lives. Uh -huh. You just need there to be a lot of suffering that's comparable to the kinds of suffering in human lives that we think is worthy of intervention. But it seemed like you, made, you wanted to make the stronger at various points, it sounded like you were making the stronger case, which would press you towards an, an extinctionist view. But it doesn't seem like you need to take the the stronger um, the stronger stance that any that the majority of or even any animals have lives or not living. I agree. So that's why I maybe I didn't stress that much this. I'll take it into account for for, for in other presentations. But I agree. I mean, I, I try to present. I, I first introduce the basic case then the stronger case, and then the very strong case. So yeah, maybe I should have stressed uh, more this, that, uh, you know, I believe that the very strong case uh, is, is right, but uh, even if you don't, uh, you may well accept the a bit less strong case. <coughs> and, uh, and the basic case, as I said, I think is quite a controversial. Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you for that uh, great talk. Um, in the Q&A, Given how uh, willing you were throughout the talk and most of the Q&A to be controversial and provocative and a little bit pessimistic, I was a little bit surprised when you said, yeah, it seems absolutely clear to you that humans have very good lives on balance. I, I might have expected you to be similarly realistic or pessimistic about the prospects for many human lives in a world like this one. Um, so why are you not an anti-natalist? Or at the very least, why uh, do you think humans have such good lives? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, okay, um, I think that uh, there are many humans who live lives that are not worth living, right? And I think that if you are an egalitarian, that you, if you take, egal if you take egalitarianism seriously, or prioritarianism, or, or, or something entirely, well, any, any view that focuses on the ones that are worse off, uh, it seems clear that that this value it's not compensated by the value other people uh, enjoy. Mm -hmm. so I'm only with that. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, if you are a utilitarian, I think that it may well be that uh, considering all the happiness and all the suffering, there might be more happiness than, than suffering. For but, humans uh, overall. For humans, ah. yeah. And not only for humans. I, I, I mean, I think that for many other animals too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I, it's not an, that I am a pessimistic and I, I want to uh, be dogmatic here. Yeah, everything's terrible. I, I'm trying to be reasonable, you know. I, I'm trying to figure out these things, you know. I suspected a difference in tone when you talk about humans. I was wondering, but that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like for instance, um, deers, yeah? Mm -hmm. I prefer to use the word deers rather than deer. Mm -hmm. Deers, I think, uh, on the overall, live good lives, yeah, for instance. Uh, whales do. Uh, apes do, yeah, many animals do. And on so. that optimistic note, <laughs> <laughs> on that optimistic note, we'll thank Oscar. Yeah. <laughs>